think I might just ask you for a copy of the kind of summary about uh, his significance. Uh, he truly was the father of American landscape architecture. Um, I just want to start with the fact that uh, just a little bit more than a month before the World's Columbian Exposition opened in uh, on May 1st in 1893, the, there were already um, the sort of uh, American community of architects and landscape architects and designers and, and, and civic leaders knew that this exposition was going to be something that was going to be extremely important. And so even though they hadn't yet gone and they hadn't yet seen it, they gave Daniel Burnham, the chief of construction, an award at this fancy gala dinner. Burnham and uh, FLO had a wonderful relationship, but Frederick Law Olmsted couldn't be there that night. And Burnham must have felt that it was almost unfair that he was receiving this award because he stood up to the podium and he said, each of you knows the name and genius of him who stands first in the heart and confidence of American artists the creator of your own parks and many other city parks. In the highest sense, he is the planner of the exposition. An artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. And so um, I just really kind of love to start at that moment, the fair hadn't yet opened and already everybody was being told, credit goes, to the design of the fair to Frederick Law Olmsted. But before I get into the planning of the fair and the fairgrounds, I wanna give you a little bit of introduction to Chicago and the history of our park system. And uh, essentially, you know, Chicago um, is not a really old city, at least compared to many of you on the East Coast. It was established as a city in 1837. And there was a lot of agitation for parks in the 1850s and 60s. And um, the people on the south side of Chicago, and it was really um, a, a, a separate suburb of Chicago, um, that were really leading the parks movement in Chicago. So um, when you see this Rand McNally map on the left, I'm really referring to the part on the bottom. Um, of course, the part on the right is Lake Michigan. And so um, after a lot of rallying and a lot of, um, uh, attempts at getting legislation for parks. Um, there were kind of groups on the north side of the city, which is kind of the top of the um, plan, the west side of the city, which is the left of the plan, and then the south side of the city, kind of all really at the outskirts of the city that were trying to uh, get legislation to create parks. Finally, in 1869, um, there were actually three separate acts of, of state legislation establishing three separate park districts. And as I said, the kind of leader in all of this was the South Park District. And um, so the South Park District would uh, have the power to create parks all kind of at that bottom part of the city. I'm kind of, this is just my segue into that you'll see that those big green swaths on the bottom are the part that, that Frederick Law Olmsted laid out. And then the idea was that this would kind of be a circle of green that would encircle the city with these beautiful boulevards or pleasure drives. And so um, the group that was in charge of the South Park, the newly formed South Park District, uh, there were some, a couple of prominent Chicagoans who had ties with Olmsted. And uh, there was a, an attorney who was very involved in the parks movement named Jonathan Scammon. And so they had already been talking about having Olmsted come and lay out their South Park there had been talk about maybe having him lay out all the parks in Chicago, but only the South Park District could afford the cost of hiring the Olmsted firm because they had the downtown loop within their taxing jurisdiction. So Olmsted, you know, in 1869, um, he, and they were kind of laying the groundwork for this in 1868, he had been spending time in town because he was, he and Calvert Vox were involved in laying out the town of Riverside, which of course is now recognized as the first planned community in the United States. I'm sure many of you know about Riverside. Instead of the typical military grid that we usually have in Midwestern communities, um, Olmsted and Vox created this fabulous plan all kind of around the contours of the Des River. 
and um, with these winding streets and lots where the, um, the houses were pushed way back on the lot. It's a really fun place to get lost even today because it's on those windy streets, you always get lost. Um, but so he was in town uh, in 1868, laying out the town of Riverside and some of these park leaders said, we want you to come and visit the site that we have in mind to create this fabulous park in Chicago. When Olmsted came and he looked at the site, did he say, ah, what a beautiful place for a park? Not exactly. He said, if the search had been made for the least park-like ground within miles of the city, nothing better meeting that requirement could have been found. So Frederick Law Olmsted was not in love with our natural Midwestern landscape. It was very flat, it was very mundane, it was very marshy, sandy. He thought it really only had one redeeming feature. And of course, anybody who's been to Chicago knows what that is, its relationship with Lake Michigan, because this was a site that fronted on to the lake. He wrote, the lake can be made by artificial means no more grand or sublime. So he used Lake Michigan as the guiding theme for his plan, which was for a thousand uh, 55 acre park, 1055. Um, and, uh, and it was really, you know, I, I keep saying the south side of the city, but back then it was a suburban town and it was part of the brainchild of the man, Paul Cornell, who was laying out this town that there had to be a fabulous park. Um, it also ended up being the site of University of Chicago. So that was another part of his vision of placemaking, that there should be a really major important park and a major university. So Olmsted, um, you know, they get the legislation in place, they hire Olmsted and Vox, and they come back and they lay out this incredible plan. And as you can see, it's kind of, um, uh, very, very geared towards water, which makes sense based on his feeling of inspiration. And his idea was that you'd be able to enter the Eastern Division, which is gonna be the part that will become Jackson Park, by boat from Lake Michigan. So this whole, in this plan I'm showing you, uh, East is up. And you'd be able to navigate through a very rugged series of waterways, very shadowy and mysterious. And then you would come to the Midway Plaisance which is the middle garden. And essentially he did name that long boulevard in the middle, Midway Plaisance on his plan. You would be able to kind of take your boat and he'd be able to sail down that formal canal that would take you into that little lake when you got to the Western division, which, is, which became Washington Park. And as many of you know, he was inspired by the English landscape and he often, and combined elements of the sublime and the beautiful. And so the sublime, these sort of dark shadowy spaces that might make you almost a little nervous were on the Eastern division. And then the beautiful or the graceful were these bright, sunny, um, calm spaces like the sheep meadow. And of course, yes, they did have a new flock of sheep every year that would graze freely in the park. They had somebody's job, but was the shepherd to round them up at night. Now, Daniel Burnham uh, kind of enters into the story after Frederick Law Olmsted. So um, I don't know if you've read The Devil in the White City. It's really a good book. Um, but I think he kind of downplayed the fact that uh, the kind of the relationship um, and the importance of Olmsted in Chicago. Another great book um, that was very inspiring to Eric Larson, who wrote The Devil in the White City, is The City of the Century by Donald Miller. At any rate, Daniel Burnham um, gets involved with the South Park Commission um, pretty much by the mid, uh, early mid 1870s. So again, we've already got the plan uh, for the park. Um, and essentially he was a struggling young architect. He and uh, his good friend, John Wellborn Root had just founded their own firm. They were just really barely making ends meet but somebody who was sort of a tastemaker in Chicago told a man named John Sherman that when he's getting his new mansion designed, that he should have these young architects design his new mansion for the happening new district of Prairie Avenue in Chicago. And so when Burnham would go to pay 
you know, visits with the Sherman family. And John Sherman was the um, owner of the Union Stockyards in Chicago. The, who would answer the door but um, John Sherman's beautiful 16-year-old daughter, Margaret. And so when Burnham would come to discuss plans and modifying the plans, every time he would get to see the beautiful daughter, they fell in love and they got married. And do you think that one of the richest men in Chicago is going to have his daughter married to a struggling architect? That was not going to happen. So basically, John Sherman was on the board of commissioners for the South Park Commission. So all of a sudden, all of the jobs uh, for architecture and bridges and structures went to uh, Burnham and Rudd. And they were, they were talented, and um, Burnham, Daniel Burnham was a great networker as well. Um, now, one thing that I should have mentioned when I said that their plan, that beautiful plan I showed you was published in 1871, is that it happened right before the Great Chicago Fire. And because of that, that is really what ended up being a huge impediment to getting the plan executed. And, and so they ended up hiring um, Horace Cleveland, who had done some work for um, Olmsted, uh, to be kind of an in-house guy to kind of try to implement the Olmsted plan as well as he could. So the Olmsted firm wasn't really that involved. By 1885, this plan that I show you um, shows really what was implemented in the Eastern Division, the part that would become Jackson Park. And so this is showing you kind of an overlay of the original plan for this section with what had been executed. So it's, it's showing you, you know, what the Olmsted and Vox plan called for. And I do want to point out the fact that, um, that when you look at the interconnected lagoon system, which is a hugely important theme, that the part in the middle was a peninsula. So if you kind of look at the way the lagoon works, there's lots of little islands, but you'll notice one kind of big peninsula and there were a lot of natural um, oak trees and the rest he thought wasn't not, not very good natural vegetation. So Burnham and Root were hired and they started designing bridges and buildings like that building, that little sort of beach house that you see on the top. And the part that's in green is all that was there by 1885. Around this time, people in America already knew that in 1892, that there would be a World's Fair that would happen in America to celebrate Columbus. This is all so <laughs> interesting for this moment, but Columbus, quote unquote, discovering America. They, they, Chicagoans decided that that fair should be here in Chicago. People, especially all you East Coast folks, thought of us as a cow town. They thought this is the chance to show everyone that this is this very exciting young city that has culture and uh, it's gonna be just a very exciting place to highlight for World's Fair. And so um, some prominent Chicagoans went to the next World's Fair, which was in Paris and it was the Exposition Universal in 1889 and tried to study and learn everything they can about World's Fair so that they could put together a great presentation because they would then have to argue to Congress that Chicago should win the fair. Um, everybody was really surprised. It was came between Chicago and New York that Chicago won the honor of hosting the fair in 1890. By that point, Olmsted had been already involved with this kind of fair effort for a little while. They had Olmsted um, identifying sites in Chicago. Everybody was lobbying for their neighborhood. There was a period where they thought there'd be two sites, one downtown and, and, and uh, one somewhere else. And it really ended up pretty much just being one site, which Olmsted had recommended as his first choice, which was, you know, what became what by then was known as Jackson Park, the Eastern Division of his original plan. He largely felt that it had to have Lake Michigan as a backdrop. He also thought that because so little of his plan had been executed that you wouldn't have to mess up, you know, landscape that had already been um, laid out. So basically he and his young associate at that time, Henry Codman, um, had this major meeting with um, Burnham and Root and when you read about this, they talk about that they had these big giant pieces of brown paper. And I just, I picture them sitting on the floor, cutting out these giant pieces of paper, kind of looking at how all the pieces of the layout would fit together. And in this very long description that's out, really interesting, Olmsted wrote that there should be a great architectural court with a body of water therein, 
there should be a formal canal leading northward from this court to a series of broader waters of lagoon character so that the principal exposition buildings would each have water as well as land frontage and would be approachable from boats. And so that kind of formal T shape in the water you can kind of see is towards the bottom. And that was the court of honor, which became a very iconic part of the fairgrounds. I also wanna point out that the statue of the Republic um, which was this tremendously huge monument that was made out of staff, like most of the um, buildings and the um, sculptures made out of a type of plaster, um, had um, her, was completely gilded in gold except for her hands and her face. So um, here we see her from the back, her back is to Lake Michigan. So this is the court of honor. Um, so, Burnham and others were looking to the Paris Exposition. Everybody thought very positively of what had happened in Paris in 1889. And um, they, they wanted to have kind of a Beaux-Arts um, design, a Beaux-Arts layout. Um, of course, um, Burnham had actually not been academically trained. He tried to get into Yale and um, I don't know, some other maybe even Harvard, didn't get in. So he had not been academically trained, um, but he did compile, it was his job to compile kind of all of the architects who would be involved with designing the fair. And he brought in a lot of architects who had either been trained at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, like Richard Morris Hunt, or architects who had been trained by someone uh, who had been trained at the Beaux-Arts. So there was definitely this, this um, the sort of bias that it's going to be this very classical architecture and the layout itself, of course, having that formal court fit right in. Um, some of the Chicago architects really felt slighted by this. There were only a couple of Chicago architects that were part of the group. Um, one Chicago architect who was part of the group, uh, he was already considered so important that they couldn't leave him out, and that was Louis Sullivan. But he really didn't fit into this whole sort of Beaux-Arts um, pigeonhole. Um, and of course, you probably know about, um, about Adler and Sullivan, and he ended up being kind of the mentor to Franklin Wright. And so he ended up, um, and I guess I should have said back here where I showed this um, painting in color, that a decision was made sort of fairly well into the, into the planning that all one of the unifying elements of the building and it would also be something you could do very quickly, uh, is that they would be whitewashed. So it becomes the white city. Um, and so Louis Sullivan didn't like that. He was into lots of color and ornamentation. So he was given the assignment to do the transportation building and he basically ignored the, um, the assignment to have classical white buildings. So we ended up with one building that was quite different than, than the rest. Here's a little bit of summary of the whole process of kind of transforming the grounds into the um, fairgrounds for the World's Columbian Exposition. And just notice the picture on the top, those men are all using hand wheelbarrows. So you can, you can only imagine what went into this. Uh, it had a $28 million construction budget, which would be over 775 million today. Um, it required 40,000 skilled laborers. They used 75 million feet of lumber, 18,000 tons of steel and iron, 30,000 tons of staff, which remember that's a type of um, plaster. Um, 700 accidents happened just in the first year of construction and 18 of them were um, fatal. The whole grounds would occupy 690 acres and there would be a total of 65,000 exhibits. Now, of course, we know that if it's gonna mark uh, the quote unquote discovery of America by Columbus, it was supposed to be in 1892. There were a whole bunch of things that caused setbacks. And so then it was decided it would be in 1893. And so they just had a dedication day um, in the Manufacturing and Liberal Arts Building on Columbus Day of 1892. If you've read The Devil in the White City, you know that the whole ceiling kept blowing off and there were a lot of problems with it. They weren't really ready. 
But by the time the fair opened, they it was almost magical that what what the, what the how they had to move heaven and earth to actually create this fairgrounds. I I can't even imagine. But those books both are really good sources for trying to understand what it was like. Um, one of the amazing things about the fair is it was the first time that most people, uh, probably from out throughout the world, had ever seen electricity. And so on May 1st, 19, uh, 1893, when President Cleveland uh, was uh, officially dedicating the fair, he flipped a switch and it was to turn on the electricity and all of the fountains and um, all of this, you know, everything just sort of came alive. Um, but then that night when everybody could see those white buildings just bathed in light, um, it was even more extraordinary. And people, you can't even imagine what it must have been like for these 19th century people to, to see all of this. And I mean, honestly, a whole other presentation could be on the innovations, the moving sidewalks, all the different things. Um, but I really wanted to stay focused more on um, the design. Although I did throw in a little bit of that kind of stuff. And, and just the magnitude of the size of these buildings, the Manufacturer and Liberal Arts Building, if that it was the largest building, you know, of course it was, a, they were all temporary buildings, but it was the largest space, interior building space in the country. And basically you could, if you put 23 football fields in there, you'd still have room for something more. So it was just um, humongous. And the exhibits, as I said, there were thousands and thousands of them, but but a lot of them were very whimsical. Here's the agricultural building, and here's a couple of the exhibits that I always got a kick out of. Um, so I don't even need to read those because you can read for yourself. Um, just the idea of making sculptures out of prunes, just and having to ship it from from Germany or whatever, just cracks me up. Um, the Palace of Fine Arts was a, a building designed by Charles Atwood, who was in Burnham's office, and. Um, so one of the things that I think is really fascinating is um, that the um, lions that were the sculptures that were sculpted by uh, Edward Kemys that, that were um, guarding the front of the fine arts building were later cast in bronze and put in front of our Chicago's Art Institute. So there's a, there's a few connections. That's a connection if you're visiting that you can always stop by and say hi to our lions. Sculpture was very important um, and uh, a number of the sculptors were among the nation's um, most acclaimed artists. And that included Daniel Chester French, who went on to do the um, Lincoln Monument. Um, Frederick McManis was the assistant to St. Gaudens. And um, I don't know much about Mary Lawrence, but I had to throw in that there was at least one woman sculptor that was involved. And then Laredo Taft, you may not know because he was really Chicago's preeminent sculptor and I'm not sure how well known he is outside of Chicago. Um, but one really fun story about Taft is he had a lot of women students and they were um, really running out of time. Everybody was running out of time in, to get prepared for the fair. And his building was the horticulture building on the bottom. So he did all the sculptural embellishments. And he told Burnham, you know, if I'm gonna get, uh, if I'm gonna get these sculptures done in time for the fair, I'm gonna to have to use my female students because otherwise there's no way I can get this done. We're gonna to have to include the, the girls. And Burnham said, I don't care if you use white bunnies, just get it done. And so that got to be sort of a funny little sort of cliche about the girls who worked in, um, for, in Taft's studio. Now, um, the recent Olmsted papers, you could just, probably spend a year going over everything that was written and said and all the correspondence and meetings and and still feel like you need another year to just soak it all in. There, there's, there's so much and it's so, so fascinating. Um, but um, the his approach to the landscape, I mean, I was thinking about the fact that landscape architects are usually trying to design a site and they're imagining what that place would look like in 50 years, in 100 years. He had two years. Can you imagine? And so um, a lot of the plant material ended up really being kind of gathered and transplanted from um, Illinois countryside. This is one of the things that he wrote, especially about shorelines, because you know he's very much obsessed with the water and the shorelines are really important. He said, the desired result 
is to be accomplished largely by thick, luxuriant growths of herbaceous aquatic vegetation along the shore, rooted partly above and partly below the surface of the water. And of course, the idea was to create obscure and poetic beauty through the intricate conjunction of various forms of vegetation and the complex dispositions of light and shade. And it's, it's so fascinating, you know, of course, we all know that Olmsted really didn't love showy flower gardens. And he talked all about how in these big masses of plantings that flowers should be sort of nestled in there so that it just, you just get a glint and a glimmer of what the color looks like, nothing, nothing too showy. Um, this uh, image that you see here, of course, is the East and West Lagoon with the watered island. So that, that peninsula that I had showed you was kind of dug and kind of uh, recreated into an island. And Olmsted wanted to keep this island free of any buildings or any obstructions whatsoever. And of course, now it's really hard to see this plan, so I'm sorry that it didn't come out better. But now you can, you can now download all of the plants from the National Park Service. It's just, it's, it's like, I feel like a kid in a candy store. And so I don't know if you can see, but really his vision was there'd be some paths, and this would be the 19th century idea of a nature preserve, no buildings. Well, as, as soon as he started kind of publishing the general schematic design, everybody wanted their pavilion on the island. He was getting all this pressure. And so he was sort of thinking, well, what do we do? Uh, you know, this is, goes against exactly what he wanted. And then he writes, after a time demands came for the use of the island for a great variety of purposes. And at length, we became convinced that it would be impossible to successfully resist these demands when we reluctantly reached this conclusion, <laughs> this is so Olmsted, right? Um, the question with us was, which of all of these, of these propositions urged, if adopted, would have the least obtrusive and disquieting result? So I, I just love that. So he decided that out of all of these proposals that were being shoved down his throat, that the, that the one that was least invasive, least obtrusive, was the proposal for the Japanese pavilion. And this was, this was very exciting because it was sort of a new opportunity for the East and the West. And um, the uh, Japanese government wanted to create, re sort of recreate an ancient Japanese temple. And it was called the Ho'oden. And it basically represents a phoenix bird with its wings stretched out. And so you can see it's in three units. And each of those three sections of the building represented, the interiors represented a different phase of Japanese culture and history. And so here's one of the interior spaces and they have these beautiful Japanese screens and murals. And just remember this image because it's, it's gonna come up again. Now, I kind of referenced the fact that we all know that he didn't like showy gardens and displays. And of course, in addition to getting, you know, having everybody want to take over his island, he also then got kind of stuck having to do some showy Victorian gardens not the kind of thing he really, really liked. Now this particular view, so I can't always tell you where every view is, but sometimes I can, and more and more I'm getting better at that. This view was right next to that horticultural building that I showed you. And so they of course had the showy gardens right next to the horticultural building. But much to the chagrin of Olmsted, in addition to this little strip, see that bridge? You'd cross the bridge to the wooded island. You saw my little rooftops of the Ho'o Den. But in addition to the Japanese garden, you just didn't just have his beautiful shrubs and the oak trees. They were also, that was also the place where they let all of the um, seed companies like Ball Seed and, and major sort of gardening companies have their showy, their showy gardens. So that was not, not what Olmsted had had in mind. You probably know, I probably don't have to tell you, Olmsted was literally obsessed with boats. I don't think this was just a Chicago thing. I don't know, you can tell me afterwards if you've seen this in other plans or other <laughs> aspects of Olmsted, but um, he was really obsessed with boats. So in, there was lots and lots and lots of pages in the Olmsted papers written about boats. But, but in this little passage, first he was talking about waterfowl and how it was really important they were gonna bring in like beautiful birds and that they had to like have these birds just the right number of them landing swooping in he also said an important contribution it has been calculated 
by the designers would be made through boats moving upon the waters, but this only provided that it shall be found practicable to procure boats in considerable numbers of a character as finely, delicately, and subtly uh, adapted to the general scenic, poetic, I can't see the word under there because my thing is, um, is, is blocking it, my sc screen sharing, but you can probably read it, something blah, 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 other elements that may be referred to. Those other elements were the birds. And I mean, he has pages and pages of his details about how he wants these boats. It would include, you can see here's a Japanese boat, and he even wanted Japanese fisher families to be shipped in from Japan so they would be on the boats. Um, he also, here's an example of an electric launch. He had pages about what colors those awnings could and couldn't be. There were gondolas from Venice that were also shipped in. So it's just, I just think it's just fascinating. It's all about creating scenery. Now the Midway Plaisance, remember that was that long strip in the middle. That would become the part of the fairgrounds that would have rides and it would have these um, sort of by our standards today, very, very strange displays of exotic people. The ride that was the kind of uh, preeminent ride, <laughs> the, the centerpiece of the Midway was the Ferris wheel. And of course, every fair has to have an icon. The Paris fair had the Eiffel Tower. And of course, in Chicago, we had the Ferris wheel. Um, as I mentioned, these displays of peoples were very strange. Um, they were considered educational, and there was uh, a man at the U of C and, uh, that was an anthropologist who was sort of in charge of kind of curating this, but literally they were bringing in kind of indigenous people from these very exotic places. I think even the word exotic is really considered racist today. Um, and they were like putting them, it was like people like zoo being treated like they were in the zoo. Um, and of course, many of them were people of color, and speaking of people of color, there was a lot of controversy amongst Chicago's African Americans about whether or not they should be involved in this fair because there were no, the, the exhibitry didn't include at all the contributions of African Americans. Frederick Douglass said, yes, I think we should be involved. And they had a colored day and he was involved with a Haitian exhibit. But Ida B. Wells wanted to, to launch a boycott. The two of them finally agreed to publish a paper about uh, that how the Negro uh, the Negroes of Chicago had been left out uh, or really of America it shouldn't just be of Chicago had been left out of the fair and its planning and they published this pamphlet and everyone who came to the Haitian exhibit got a copy of this pamphlet so there's a whole other really interesting um, dynamic that um, uh, it again could be its whole own lecture. After the fair, um, a lot of the buildings burned down, a lot of them spontaneously, they were very flammable. Others were demolished. So it was just a temporary fair. And, um, but there was a decision uh, that Burnham made that he really wanted to keep one building as the um, kind of to be an homage of the fair, which I'll show you in a second. <laughs> um, but, uh, but Olmsted's sons were involved. They had already been involved and they would become involved with now, what do we do with the site after the fair? John Charles Olmsted, uh, as you probably know, had been working with Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. Um, for a long time already by this point. And he was very involved with the planning for the fair and then very involved afterwards. Frederick Law um, Olmsted Jr was uh, at the time that the fair planning was going on was at Harvard and he spent his summers working on the fair. So by the time they were asked to come back and think about what should happen with the grounds, um, the firm was then Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliot. And uh, the first thing they looked at was the Midway Plaisance. And so in 1894, before they had really even done a plan for the whole rest of the grounds, they started doing plans for the Midway Plaisance and they felt very strongly about putting the water in, which they had been advocating for for years. And so they did all of these plans and they were really lobbying the park commissioners, let's do this project. Park commissioners were nervous. There were a lot of engineering aspects they didn't trust. They thought the water was just gonna start in Washington Park in the, in the little lake and it, that the water was lower in Jackson Park and it was just gonna drain back into Lake Michigan. There were some issues with the ICU tracks, which is that crossing. 
But the Olmsteads convinced them, and they actually started phase one, which was, you can see this map, this plan in the middle, it was to just dig down the first couple of feet. And there's the Chicago Tribune actually showing how they did that. They never came back. They were, they didn't have the money. There was too many obstacles, so they never came back. So if you go to visit the University of Chicago, which lines the Midway Plaisance, you will see a dip in the landscape, and that was this abandoned canal project. So even though that part didn't get done, Olmsted and Olmsted and Elliot did get to redesign Jackson Park after the fair, and this is their plan. And interestingly, the park looks a lot like this in many ways today. So this is their 1895 plan, and it had a couple of kind of overriding themes. And that was that the lake had to be the most important feature as it had been in each of these plans, and they would go back to creating that interconnected system of waterways. Um, that there would be fields. So again, it reminds us a little bit about the idea of what Washington Park was and Jackson Park. So the fields would be quiet and pastoral landscapes that would include space for games. The lagoons, you know, as I said, those would be um, places where they could have boating and it would tie into Lake Michigan. But it would also be this idea, again, of all those little dotted islands that would be very lushly planted. And then the idea of saving one of those buildings would be the formal part of the design, which would be taking the old fine arts palace and making it into the Field Museum. I don't know if you know that the Fine Arts Palace uh, became the Chicago Field Museum for the beginning of its history. And here, uh, I just stumbled upon this the other day in the Chicago Tribune, is a rendering of what they said this would all look like. And so we're kind of looking from the south and looking to the northeast. So you see the Field Museum, um, you know, at the, in the sort of the back. Um, so, you know, again, it, as you may know, the Olmsteads often included a, like a smaller area of formal design. And so this, there were, in addition to um, just having the museum, the landscape around it was meant to be formal. That formal basin of the waterway never happened. But um, you can see that music court that looks like the wagon, spokes of a wagon wheel. Um, you kind of almost have to be from an aerial perspective to see it today, but that actually was a music court. So there were these formal aspects. They did um, save the building and it was the Field Museum for many years, but then it started to fall apart. And Julius Rosenwald, who's this great hero, the um, CEO of um, Sears in Chicago, and he was a great philanthropist. He was the guy who came up with the idea. The Field Museum moved out and uh, Marshall Field wanted his own museum, which you've maybe been to. And so it was just left to decay and this is how it looked. And so the people were talking about tearing it down and Louis Sullivan said it put architecture back by, by 25 years and 50 years, whatever. And, and Julius Rosenwald said, no, we must save it and it should be a science museum. And he gave $7 million of his own money, probably even a little bit more, and even took the park commissioners on a trip to Germany to look at the most cutting edge science museums that had been opening up in the world. And so um, it's because of him that we have the Museum of Science and Industry in the park. Another formal aspect of the design that was kind of innovative, um, I, I talked to Charlie Beveridge about this one time, and it you know, perhaps wasn't the only first, but it was among the first, uh, the time, first time that the Olmsted firm had put an outdoor gymnasium in one of their plans. So part of the 1895 plan, they included, you can see these kind of two oval tracks and then it was going to have you know a little playground in the middle and uh, only one of those tracks was originally implemented and so I found this in 1896 the next year they were using it for bike races so you can see this article called Mecca for Riders said if there was any one spot in Chicago last Sunday afternoon which contained more bicycles and riders to the square foot than any other. It was the new speeding track in Jackson Park, south of 60th Street, between two and five o'clock on a Sunday. This oval piece of ground is one whirling mass of flying wheelmen. Men and women riders of every size, costume, and equipment gather there by the hundreds to hit her up for a few miles of a cinder path or to sit in groups in the grassy border and to watch the throng of e uh, eager scorchers. And here is an aerial, so you can see later they did actually implement the two path, the two ovals. That 
concept, and I don't, I don't know how I'm doing on time, Dee Dee, but I'm get, I am coming to the end. <laughs> am I doing okay? <laughs> so that concept of an outdoor gymnasium ends up really being a very influential idea. So um, as you know, um, you know, Olmsted retires and passes away, and the Olmsted brothers start their firm. And in 1903, the South Park commissioners, um, the superintendent, J. Frank Foster, asked John Charles to come and have a meeting with him. And they are um, sitting at a hotel and on the back of a piece of hotel stationery, um, you can just picture John Charles just frantically sketching um, as J. Frank Foster says, I think these new parks, and these were parks that were geared towards very crowded, immigrant neighborhoods in Chicago near the stockyards. They should have, you know, here's, here's the menu of all the items I think they should have. Ball fields, running tracks, sand pits, swimming pools, wading pools, outdoor gymnasia, um, playgrounds, landscaped areas for strolling with shade trees, and then a community center, which we call a field house. I think it was actually the Olmsteads maybe that coined the, frame, the phrase field house, because you do see that in their plans. Uh, with a library, lunchroom, auditorium, indoor gymnasium, and club rooms. And so they get hired, the Olmsted brothers, this is December of 03, they immediately get hired with D.H. Burnham and Company to design 14 of these new parks in Chicago. They called them small parks, but as, as you can see, some of them were as large as 320 acres, so we always call them neighborhood parks. And essentially, um, they did plans for 14. Seven were called squares because they were less than 10 acres. Seven were called parks because they were larger than 10 acres. The um, red um, squares and rectangles show all of the locations. So there were 14 of them. They literally designed and built 10 of them by the end of 1905. They started this project in early 04 and they built 10 of these new parks beautifully designed, fully, all those ideas were fully executed in a year. I mean, how did they do that? Nobody can even, we can, they can't even build a bicycle path in Chicago we've been trying to get on the lakefront for five years. And here are these buildings that had, these parks that had beautiful landscapes and wading pools, swimming pools, and field houses. They were a whole new idea in, in parks, and it was really an idea that the Olmsted brothers kind of honed with J. Frank Foster and others that were involved in the playground movement, other leaders, even including Jane Adams. And so all that list of all of those items, you know, they would have, um, you could come and get the, you know, all year long and get a, um, a towel and soap and use the shower baths. And then, and of course, in the summer, you could also rent a swimsuit and use a swimming pool. Uh, they had libraries, they teach classes in, um, it, they teach English classes and classes in Americanization. You could get a hot meal at a very low cost. Doctors and nurses would come from time to time and do immunizations. And it was such a completely influential kind of new shift in what a park could be that there was this huge parks conference in Chicago in 1907 and President Teddy Roosevelt issued a national statement telling people you must send representatives to this conference so they can see these new parks, one of the most notable civic achievements in any American city. Um, and so we ended up with um, a whole bunch of Olmsted Brothers designs and a lot of those parks are on the National Register. Um, Jackson Park uh, continued to change and evolve a little bit, but it really, that 1895 plan was really implemented. Um, but one thing that did happen was uh, 25 years later in 1918, everybody felt that this fair had been such an important thing to Chicago and to the nation that they wanted to have some kind of more of a visual icon in the park. And so they hired Daniel Chester French to do a Golden Lady, the Statue of the Republic, a smaller version, which is still in the park today. And there she is. Another really interesting thing is that the Japanese pavilion was one of the few things in the park that was given as meant to be a permanent gift. And during the time of the WPA, when the Chicago Park District was formed, there was a, a Chicago Tribune writer, this guy, you can see James O'Donnell Bennett, and he said, you know, that was such a beautiful place in the park. And it's, you guys have just let it kind of fall apart. And it was the depression. He said, you should go ask for a WPA grant to restore it. 
and the park district did and it was beautifully restored and even fancier Japanese gardens were added. And so for years, people were able to enjoy that. And the restoration of it even included restoring those interior screens. And this was kind of an exciting thing because when I was at the park district all those years and we moved a couple times, we actually found this and then it got put in storage and we lost it again. And then I spent like two years trying to find it and we found it again. The sad thing is that in 1946, some boys playing with matches, or perhaps they were just really prejudiced against Japanese people, could have been, they said they were just playing with matches, burned down the Ho'odan. So it doesn't exist anymore. And so now I'm leaving you with an image. Can you hear that? Oh my gosh. I, I live on a quiet street in Chicago, not, not tonight. Um, an image of the plan for how Jackson Park looked in 1930, and then an image of how Jackson Park looks a couple of years ago. Um, and so I, oh, and I wanted to also mention that one of the really exciting things that happened in recent years was, um, and it was, it's kind of a long story, so I'll tell you the really short version, is we got in a big fight with the Army Corps of Engineers. And they finally agreed that if we could get a funder to pay for somebody who could do a planting plan to do it right. And this was a big project to plant in Jackson Park to um, increase its sustainability for wildlife. That if we could find somebody that would pay, that we could then get a firm that knows what they're doing instead of the Army Corps doing these bubble diagrams. And so there, a funder was um, identified and Patricia O'Donnell's firm of Heritage Landscapes did these unbelievable grading and planting plans and that project uh, was like a five-year project of planting just got um, finished. So with that, um, I think I can turn it back to Dee Dee and she'll tell me if people have questions and if I went too long. No, you did a great job. Thank you so much. It was just fascinating and we do have a few questions in the chat box and I encourage people if you have anything uh, in your mind now is a chance to let us know. I'll just go quickly. First, I want to say you just uh, did a shout out to Patricia O'Donnell, and I'm glad to say she's with us tonight. So, oh, I didn't know I <laughs> that uh, that compliment uh, unannounced. And yeah, well, I'm a, I'm like I'm an Olmsted firm. I'm also a Patricia O'Donnell firm too. So, I mean, Patricia <laughs> O'Donnell fan. So that is great. And one of the first questions we received was about the Statue of the Republic, and you answered that for us that we can still see. Uh, that today in the uh, in the park, uh, and we learn from a gentleman from Maine, and this is uh, very interesting to me that the state of Maine says Jeffrey Ryan, that Maine building was dismantled and shipped back to Maine, ah! it was reassembled still in Poland Spring, Maine. Oh, that's great! I love to hear that. The yeah, I didn't even go into the part about the states, and I'm sorry about that. But for the most part, when you look at the top of this plan, you see the Museum of Science and Industry. The states, most of those state buildings were just kind of straight to the north, so just right above that. And you know, when I showed you, you probably don't remember everything I showed you, but when I showed you that picture of Burnham and Root's um, pavilion on the beach, Iowa, for some reason, didn't have money for their own pavilion. So they let them kind of get that all decked out with a whole bunch of corn stalks all around it. And they made that into the Iowa Corn Pavilion. So that's, that, that's a great tidbit about Maine. Thank you. And there is a, a frequent question in terms of were many of the sculptures saved for museums or other places? The sculptures were all plaster. And so they were just temporary as well. But here's something that's really cool is that all the sculptors were working with mech hats. And so these sculptures were enormous. They were huge. I don't even know the total height. I, the, I, I, do, I did look up the original Statue of the Republic was just a few inches shy of the um, Statue of Liberty. So just have to picture these were these enormous, enormous plaster um, sculptures, uh, mech hats. Well, I'm sorry, I'm saying this all wrong. The actual sculptures were plaster and they were huge. The mech hats were smaller. The maquettes were saved and they actually went to the Field Museum, which would have been the Museum of Science and Industry. And um, Jens Jensen, who's a whole different story, um, he had an outdoor art exhibit in 1908 and 1909, one year in Garfield Park and one year in Humboldt Park. 
didn't have money to do a lot of new art. And so he asked if he could borrow those maquettes. And because of that, we have a lot of photographs of all the different maquettes for those pieces. And a few of them people loved so much they were recast in bronze. So we do have a couple of sculptures that are smaller versions, and that's really the lion's too in front of the Art Institute. So that you couldn't come to Chicago and sort of like touch a sculpture and say this was at the exposition, but you could see sculptures were recast from maquettes. We have a question about the cool structure in the playground slide. What was that? <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. I'm gonna go back. This one? This one? <laughs> I'm not sure. The person has to tell us, wait, which one's the playground slide? Or do you mean the playground with the this? Mm, I, I don't know. We'll have to find out the answer to that. The person has to write to, in the chat box and tell me which. Now, this is Armor Square, which is um, very close to IIT. Um, if you went and visited today, you could go. But I, I'm not sure if that was. Now, oh, I bet it's this. You think it's this? This was a giant uh -huh. swing. This, this was a giant swing. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of rushed through these because uh, I, this is also could be a whole other presentation. But that was a giant swing. It's really fun to look at the plans and look at the names of the different playground equipment. Also, the field house, um, it was this, during this period was a big mural movement. And the, there were some people at the Art Institute, some artists that were really into murals. And that field house, this is Sherman Park, one of my favorites, again, named for his father-in-law. Um, they brought in students from the School of the Art Institute, and they each got like um, one big uh, panel and a couple of like smaller spandrels. And, and that was restored just a couple of years ago. So that, those were falling apart for years. So that was exciting. I'm going to do three more questions. Uh, could you uh, explain a bit more, Julia, where you got the plans and designs, and I'll and I'll jump in after you respond as well. Yeah, and I'm still trying to learn how to use them digitally. So, um, so I was in charge of an archive at the Chicago Park District, um, and we had in our archive we had seventy thousand photographs and over one hundred and ten thousand drawings. Now, not all Olmsted. These are all the drawings, all the uh, architectural, plumbing, engineering, landscape. And so, um, so I got to use a lot of that. I had the minutes from the park commissioners. But then, of course, uh, especially when I started studying the um, the Olmsted brothers plans, I wanted to use the Olmsted papers. And so I learned how to order them on microfilm. And I tried, I had various iterations of ordering them on microfilm that you had to do through a library and sit at a microfilm reader and it was always broken and blah, blah, blah. And so now all of that stuff has been digitized. So I had many years of struggling. I went to Brookline, you know, maybe twice. And now I'll let Dee, Dee tell you the exciting news of like what I did to present for, so for some of these for, the, for this presentation, I just grabbed them from online. So that's, tell them, Dee Dee. Well, that's right. And I do encourage people to go to the NAOP website where you can find Olmsted online. There you will be able to get access to these plans, maps, and designs. We have aggregated their information, not only from Fairstead that are in the archives there, uh, but also some external sources as well. And the Library of Congress correspondence is being uploaded. So it is a rich array of opportunities on Olmsted Online, and I urge you to go there. And tonight we've seen these beautiful, beautiful renderings of South Park and what happened in Chicago. Again, I encourage you to purchase the supplemental version number two by Charlie Beveridge in the Olmsted Papers. It's available through Johns Hopkins. Glorious, glorious um, renderings of what you see here tonight are in that book. And the third supplemental edition will be coming out in October, looking at Biltmore and private estates. So I hope you all will keep that in mind uh, as you think about your holiday giving. And Julia, I guess to no surprise, we do have one question uh, which says, without getting into the controversy, 
where is the part of Jackson Park where the Obama Library is proposed? Can you tell us where that is? Of course, and thank you for saying that in a way where you understand my personal dilemma. Um, oops. So here's, um, here is an aerial view of the park. And you can see we talked about the um, outdoor gymnasia. And so you can see that there was, um, in, uh, in recent years, instead of the two um, running tracks, there was one. It was actually a gift of the bears. So it's not exactly the running track that was there historically. It's like a rubber, you know, that high school kids from across the street were using. That area that you see, see that, you see what I'm talking about, the red running track? That area between those roadways uh, is the whole area where it would be occupied. The midway is kind of meeting it. There's like a little stub of the midway and that, uh, that, that whole part is, becomes part of it. Okay, well, thank you for that, because I think we all are well aware that there is a presentation by the uh, Obama Presidential Foundation to a build in Jackson Park. The National Association for Olmstead Parks has been a consulting party, and you can find our various observations and statements on the NAOP website. As Julia knows, we are profoundly concerned about the uh, proposals that have been made. And it is our hope uh, that the foundation and the city of Chicago will find a way to find an alternative site that will allow a vibrant presidential center honoring the 44th president, as well as honoring the Olmstead Parks. And as I say, you can find our comments on the NAOP website. We're gonna have- Oh, I'm just gonna just add one more thing. If anybody wants to kind of take a deeper dive and you really wanna know more about this, there's also, if you just Google section 106 uh, Jackson Park, there's a website that the city put together that uh, allows you to click onto every meeting and all of the documentation. Um, so if you, really, if you wanna take a really deep dive to understand this whole overwhelming thing, uh, there's also an, a website there as well. Great. So that is available to you. And we're going to end with one final question. This one is about watercraft. Uh, Larry Cotton wants to know where any of the watercraft saved, restored, and if so, where are they today? I have no idea. I wonder if Charlie would know that. But I do know that one of the kinds of um, boats that he was advocating for um, and oh my God, I did some research on this and now it's got, they've got a funny name and some of you will know it and now I'm not thinking of it. They actually had problems where they would explode. So I think, I don't remember, I think it was, they actually used gas and it was like a combination of gas and electric and they had problems where they would explode. So, um, so I don't know. That's, that is a great question, Larry. I have, I have no idea. I, it would be, I, I'm also just curious about whether the same boats were used in other parks and uh, I, I feel like that the newest volume of um, the Olmsted Papers is what clued me in. I don't think I really was tuned in to this issue about how obsessed he was with boats until, I mean, I did hear Charlie say it once, but until you can start reading all of those letters and he's, you just think, oh my God, this guy is so busy. How does he have time to write these long, long letters about the fact that those stripes shouldn't be green, they should be whatever, you know? So um, anyway, that if you don't have that volume, that and it, that's the newest volume right now, right, Dee Dee? Yes. You've got to get it. It's really, really fascinating. It is a fascinating one. Well, I want to say thank you so much, Julia, for an absolutely fascinating presentation. I can tell you in the chat box, we've gotten more laudatory comments than questions. Oh, thank you way to end the evening. We want to say thank you to everyone for participating. We will aim to post this on our website once I'm working with Julia on that, and we will aim to have some more of these in the future. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you, Julia, for a great- Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for coming. It's such, it's such a fun thing to do. I really enjoyed it. Have a wonderful evening, and I'll talk to you hopefully soon, Dee. All right, thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone.